Welcome, everyone, and thank you for standing by. I would like to advise you that today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the conference over to Tiffany Fairley. Thank you so much. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tiffany Fairley with NASA's Office of Communications. NASA's third wet dress rehearsal attempt with a modified test procedure concluded yesterday, April 14th. The test focused on using the ground systems at Kennedy to load propellant into the Space Launch System's rocket core stage tanks with minimal propellant operations on the upper stage. The rocket remains in a safe configuration as teams assess next steps. Here to provide opening remarks and provide an update on the path forward for the Artemis One wet dress rehearsal are Mark, Mike Serafin, Artemis One Mission Manager, NASA Headquarters, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Exploration Ground Systems, Artemis Launch Director, NASA's Kennedy Space Center, and we'll also have questions for avail available for Greg Horvath, Exploration Ground Systems Chief Engineer, NASA's Kennedy Space Center. And we'll start with remarks from Mike. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, we appreciate everybody's time to uh, to continue to follow the Artemis mission as we get ready for flight. Um, since the last time we, we spoke, uh, the team has done a tremendous job of rolling in the lessons learned and uh, the technical information that we obtained from our attempt number one on April the 3rd and attempt number two on April the 4th. Um, prior to this uh, third attempt that, that uh, we had yesterday for the wet dress rehearsal, uh, the mission management team met uh, a day prior on Wednesday the 13th and the focus of that discussion was primarily to resync the uh, the team headed into yesterday's test. Um, key topics of discussion included uh, you know closure of the actions and, and kind of updates on the procedural uh, aspects of the wet dress rehearsal uh, and what equipment inspections uh, had been performed uh, following the the two prior attempts. Uh, specific to the pad um, environmental control system and the fan outages that we had uh, causing the, the uh, scrub on attempt number one, uh, some updates to the uh, cryogenic loading operations that, that we learned through attempt number two, and then um, some procedural aspects to, uh, to preclude another um, liquid hydrogen vent valve issue that caused us the scrub on attempt number two as well. Um, since that time, uh, as you're aware, we had the uh, issue with the interim cryo propulsion stage or the upper stage's uh, gas, gaseous helium vent valve, uh, check valve, and uh, we modified the, um, the wet dress rehearsal procedure for that. So there were a number of changes that we talked about headed into the uh, attempt number three. And uh, at the end of that meeting, uh, the day prior to the test, we pulled all the elements and all par parties pulled go. Um, on the day of the test, uh, we met with our launch director to talk about uh, status and readiness for the, for the uh, attempt yesterday, and we had a very clean meeting. It, it took only about 25 minutes, and we had great support there from the range. Uh, the weather uh, was great for the test, and uh, the launch team and, and all of our support sites in Huntsville and Houston uh, said they were ready to go. Uh, the rocket was ready. The spacecraft was ready. So we, we proceeded into the test. And uh, during the uh, wet dress attempt number three, um, we encountered um, some, some issues with the cryogenic loading operations. Our, our launch director, Charlie, will, will walk you through that, um, both on the hydrogen and, and liquid oxygen side. And as the team uh, worked their way through the, uh, the cryogenic loading operations and, and, um, and got further into the operation than we did on our prior attempt, and gain new technical knowledge and new technical information to prepare us for flight, uh, we encountered a, um, a liquid hydrogen leak or an LH2 uh, leak on the uh, tail service mast unit. Um, the tail service mast unit on the, on the LH2 side sits on the deck, the zero deck um, of the mobile launcher, and it's about 30 feet tall, and there's an umbilical plate that is on the ground side that provides the uh, the cryogenic uh, fuel, in this case the hydrogen, from the uh, cryosphere at the perimeter of the pad and uh, up through the mobile launcher system, um, that umbilical plate provides the interface with the, uh, with the space launch system rocket to, to fuel the uh, core stage. And um, it was on the ground side of that umbilical plate that we saw um, the uh, hydrogen leak. And after troubleshooting it, uh, the, uh, the team decided to knock it off for the day because uh, when you have hydrogen leaks, 
and you have ambient oxygen out there, you only need an ignition source to, to close the fire triangle. So it was a flammability risk, and uh, and we knocked the uh, the test off as a result of that. Um, following the uh, following the wet dress attempt yesterday, uh, the mission management team met again <clears throat> at 6:30. It was a it was a fairly long day for the for the MMT. We took about 45 minutes to uh, to to roll up all the information we obtained through the test. And we talked about the art of the possible uh, moving forward. And um, we've got a couple of options in front of us. Uh, we're not ready to say exactly what the option is. It's been less than 24 hours since then, and, and folks had a pretty long day yesterday. Uh, I'm, I'm sure our launch director probably had the longest day because she got up before us to, to prep for the, uh, for the uh, tanking meeting and then, um, and then worked all the way through the day and was there with us uh, at the end of the day when we had our, uh, our post-scrub uh, MMT meeting. But uh, we've got a couple of options in front of us. Um, we are preserving the option to, uh, to reattempt the wet dress as early as um, next week. Uh, Thursday the 21st is kind of the, the earliest time that the team is comfortable with doing that. We are aware that um, our commercial crew partners and friends um, that are going to be over on uh, launch Complex 39A are setting up for a launch attempt on the 23rd uh, to launch Crew 4. Um, obviously, there's some coordination that we will continue to do with our with our range counterparts and our and our uh, uh, commercial crew and commercial Leo friends, and we're going to stay in close contact with them uh, as as we get smarter on on our path forward. So, um, that's that's pretty much my opening comments and our adventures in cryo loading and um, and uh, and our readiness. Uh, but uh, as was said earlier, the mega, mega moon rocket is fine. Um, but all the issues that we're encountering, I would say, again, are, are procedural and, and uh, lessons learned with the exception of this ground umbilical plate that, that we've got to go uh, figure out where the leak is. And, and we've got a couple of options that we're looking at there. So with that, um, those are my opening comments. All right. Well, thanks, Mike. Let's see, it's Charlie Blackwell Thompson here, uh, Artemis Launch Director. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time today. Um, I want to start off by saying that I'm really proud of the work that our team has accomplished and that we continue to do as we get through uh, wet dress rehearsal. Um, yesterday and throughout the course of the countdown, which started on Tuesday afternoon, you know, we continue to, to listen to the hardware. We continue uh, to learn as part of this process. and. Uh, and so, and we will continue to do that as we work through uh, the remaining ops of wet dress. Uh, to start off, our call to station started right on time at 5 p.m. on uh, April 12th on Tuesday, and uh, the teams worked through the procedures in configuring the flight hardware and getting us ready for tanking. And uh, as Mike described, we got into our tanking brief yesterday morning. I had to think about that for a second. Got into our tanking brief yesterday morning. And, uh, and really, we were all systems go. We did uh, experience an outage of gaseous nitrogen from the uh, off-site supplier um, just as we were getting ready to begin our tanking operations. And so that set us back a little bit uh, in our propellant loading timeline. Uh, once we reestablished the supply of the GN2, um, our team started the operations to load liquid oxygen into the rocket's core stage. Um, while loading uh, liquid oxygen, or LOCKS, as, as we like to call it, the teams when, um, were, um, we encountered a similar issue to what we had during run two, where we had a, a temperature at the inlet that was uh, showing a little warmer than we expected. And, uh, and so our teams uh, took a moment to go off and reassess the situation and, uh, and came up with uh, an alteration to, the, to our plan uh, and put that into work, and we got uh, right into our loading operations on the uh, LO2 side of things. So shortly uh, after we got into, uh, into that uh, operation, um, we began to look at the hydrogen uh, side of the interface. We had been very anxious to load hydrogen. As folks know, the hydrogen molecularly is, uh, is, uh, is very small. And uh, at cryogenic temperatures, uh, sometimes uh, in the beginning stages of loading is when you will see a leak. Um, we got through our slow fill operations. Everything was nominal, had no issues. And uh, when we transitioned to fast fill, um, which you will see an increase in pressure uh, as part of that loading operations, we did detect a leak on the tail service mast on something that we call the purge can, 
or the perch canister. It's actually on the back of the, um, the ground side plate, and we can talk about that a little bit more in the questions. But we did see a leak there. We had a couple of different contingency uh, scenarios or contingency plans that we can put into place or utilize, uh, and we did that, but it did not resolve, uh, did not resolve the leak. Um, so we went ahead and safe that operation, got into, um, into our stop flow and into a revert. And, uh, and decided that we would move on uh, to the upper stage chill down operations as we had described in our previous press conference. We, we did that, everything worked um, pretty much as expected. Um, we continued the countdown down to the T minus 10 minute hold. Uh, and as part of uh, that T minus 10 minute hold, um, we were able to not only accomplish the core stage uh, LO2 load to, to just about um, halfway, about 49%, um, we did get the core stage uh, LH2 flow fill, uh, as described, and then the upper stage uh, chill down. We also did our flight safety system testing. Our range uh, safety system testing was completed. Um, we did first motion checks. We had our booster um, DFI uh, checkout as well. We did our commanding with uh, the Johnson Space Center, our Dolly Lou. Uh, operations were all worked. Uh, we did our tanking outer mold line scans. Those were uh, completed. We did some of our guidance uh, and uh, navigation uh, checkout, uh, the Orion comm system checkout, um, and, uh, and we were also able to demonstrate a number of our contingency procedures. So um, while we did not get all the way through the, um, the planned activities, um, we certainly accomplished quite a bit. So um, after working through that, uh, and as I said, getting down to the team on its 10 minute hold, we decided uh, to, uh, to end the day as Mike uh, described, knowing that we would not be getting into the terminal portion of count. Uh, again, the team did an excellent job in accomplishing uh, the objectives as briefed. And, uh, and so we, um, we really saw very good performance across the flight systems and uh, and again, on those things that, um, that, on those activities that we accomplished, we didn't have any significant issues um, besides um, the leak that we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail in just a second. So, um, so after calling it a day, uh, we got into our drain operations and uh, got into our purges overnight. Uh, this morning, we began um, working up our troubleshooting plans for uh, how to go assess the situation. And, um, and then also getting the pad opened up and, and starting to get uh, back configured. So um, this is on the LH2. Um, the LH2, there's a, uh, and I'm sorry, you guys can't see my, my kind of my hand motions here, but you've got the LH2, you've got a flight side plate and a ground side plate, and it's really what I call the back side of that plate. There's a purge canister there. The good news is, is that there's only a few things in that purge enclosure. Um, and there's a, a couple of discrete penetrations there that we think could be, um, could be the culprit or could be the cause of, of the leak. And so we'll go, um, what we're setting up to do now is we're getting access. Um, we have access stands in the VAB. Um, we currently have those, um, they're at the pad. We had them um, taken from the VAB to the pad this morning. And uh, once we get the mobile launcher uh, zero deck configured, uh, we'll lift those up, get them into place, and we'll begin assessing those areas of the, the TSMU and, uh, and taking a look at what we think the issue might be there. So the team's developing a troubleshooting plan. Um, they got together this morning to look at um, these particular areas that we think could be the issue, um, how we get access to them, how we troubleshoot them, and, uh, and then what the forward plan is. So um, I think that's where we are um, right now. And then while we're doing that, we'll also be replenishing commodities, preparing our timelines and our procedures uh, to get ready for uh, the next opportunity. Thank you so much, Charlie. We'll now begin with the question and answer portion. Please remember to stick to one question and identify to whom it is directed. If we have time, we'll allow reporters to ask a second question. You can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can enter star two if you'd like to be removed from the queue. Your phones are now on mute and the operator will open your mic when we're ready and close your mic after you've asked your question. Again, we ask you please stick to one question. Shortly after we conclude, you can listen to a replay of this teleconference online. 
And we'll go ahead and begin with Marcia Dunn with Associated Press. Yes, hi, for Mike. I'm just wondering if one of the options under consideration is given that there is a launch coming up on the uh, pad right nearby, just going right back to the VAB, replacing the valve in the upper stage, taking care of any uh, other issues, and then going back to the pad. Is that under consideration at all at this point? And if you do do a complete top to bottom, what dress rehearsal, how much extra time in processing would that be? Thanks. Yeah, uh, Marsha, I'll take the first part of that question. Charlie probably has a better sense of the, uh, the um, timeline, but um, in terms of uh, what the uh, troubleshooting plan is, we're kind of breaking it down into a, into a series of kind of low-hanging fruit options. You know, things that are that are readily accessible. We hope that you know there's something that is fairly straightforward and and needs to be adjusted um, or is easily resolved, and and we can do that at the pad and do it in fairly short order. Um, and then there are a couple of more invasive options and. We've got to weigh those against a whole host of considerations um, that, that include, um, you know, the putting additional um, just wind stress on the vehicle. Uh, the longer we stay at the pad, the, the more we, we stress the vehicle. It's 32 stories tall. Every time the wind blows against it, it creates a bending moment, and, and over time that adds up. Um, it, we got to weigh that against environmental exposure um, out in the field, but then also uh, the um, the uh, rollback to the uh, vehicle assembly building um, to reattempt a wet dress rehearsal actually puts stress on the vehicle as well. Um, so we've we've got a series of actions that we've asked the team to uh, go off and um, provide data back um, based on uh, the core stages experience, uh, all going all the way back to uh, the Stennis Space Center and the Green Run Hot Fire Test and in the. Uh, stresses that we saw it uh, go under not only there in the test stand but also um, during transportation and some of the activities here at the Cape. Um, we've got a whole host of other constraints that we're looking at as it pertains to interfaces with the spacecraft uh, and, and we're going to weigh all those and, and we've got um, kind of a what I call a, a bucket of considerations that, that we need to, uh, to all bring to the table and we talked about what those were last night in the, uh, in the uh, post-scrub mission management team meeting. And I think once we get a better understanding of what all the considerations are, I'll, I'll be able to better answer your question. And, and Charlie, I don't know if you have any um, um, feedback on the, on the timeline as far as um, what, what it might look like. I, I really think the time, it's hard, to, it's hard to say specifically because I think it depends on the scenario. Um, Certainly there are options within the trade space. I mean, if we looked at our, our plan schedule from a, you know, rollout to wet dress, I mean, that's somewhere in the seven to 10 day uh, range if you look at what we just did as we rolled out for wet dress. Um, but there are different options that, that could be in play there. I mean, you could, you could certainly look at your schedule risk uh, for launch countdown and you could make a decision of whether or not you wanted to do a tanking prior to a launch countdown. I mean, we have a certain number of, of days that we can be uh, at the pad before we begin to bump up against our, um, our range requirements. Uh, and so you could make a strategic decision to go utilize one of those for a wet dress or a tanking uh, and do that and then some days later decide to go launch. So I think it really depends on the, the scenario from, you know, your rollback to, to your first, you know, if you were doing a tanking test, a wet dress or a launch. Thank you. Next, we'll have Bill Harwood with CBS News. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, this is for either one of you, I guess, but can, can you develop rationale to fly without ever doing the ICPS uh, at a test? And I'm asking that because, you know, most of the problems you guys have had have been on the ground side versus the rocket side, but there have been issues, I mean, you know, all the way through. I'm just wondering, could you get to a point where you could actually launch the rocket without ever fueling the ICPS? That's my question. Bill, it, it, fundamentally it comes down to risk acceptance and, and what uh, we consider to be an acceptable level of risk. Um, so I, I do believe that there is a path forward uh, 
provided that we understand what the risk is, um, it would include a whole host of considerations, um, including the um, Delta IV heavy um, flight history and the Delta Cryo second stage and um, the history of the, this particular flight element and uh, what data we've obtained through the testing to date, uh, that some of which is at the pad, some of it is in the vehicle assembly building, and some of it was done before the, um, the interim crop propulsion stage ever arrived at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, and we would have to weigh all that and understand the risk and, um, and either agree to accept that risk or decide what the uh, delta uh, work would be to get to an acceptable level of risk. Uh, we are not done with our flight test program or our ground test program yet, and, um, and we're not ready to make that determination just yet. The only thing I would add there, Mike, is that, you know, we're not talking about a flight, flight safety risk when we talk about that. We're talking about a, you know, we do have launch commit criteria that um, if, if we were to make that decision, and I know that that's still ahead, um, there are launch commit criteria that uh, protect you in the event that you were to have an issue during launch where you had an issue with loading. I mean, that would scrub your launch, but that would be the scenario that we would be talking about there is it's really a launch countdown scrub risk uh, versus a, any kind of yeah, flight that's, safety that's risk. Yeah, a, that's a great po point, Charlie, that there are also um, controls outside of the testing uh, in place, and, and the launch commit criteria is probably the single best example of that. Thank you. Next, we'll have Irene Klopp with Aviation Week. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I, probably this is for Charlie. Um, the the uh, hydrogen leak signature, was it gradual or was there a sudden uh, increase in the concentration of hydrogen in the, in the tail mass? And could you describe a little bit about what data you can get without doing a tanking that will let you let the team know that the leak has been found. Thanks. Yep, I can absolutely speak to that. And one thing I probably should have clarified when I was making my opening remarks is that um, in the cavity itself between the flight plate and the ground plate, we did not see a leak. Um, we actually saw this really on the back side of the plate. And so that's, that's really good news for us because the access is much different and much easier. Um, and, uh, and what we saw is that as soon as we went to, uh, into, fast, into fast fill, we saw the, the leak go up pretty, pretty quickly. It wasn't a gradual leak. We saw it spike up. Um, and, and I know you can't see my hands here, Irene, but what happens is around the backside of that plate, there's like a purge shroud, and it's a fairly small enclosure. And so any amount of leakage in that enclosure, when you've got a sample line in there that's, that's pulling that and looking at that concentration, I mean, it's a small volume, and so any amount of leak is gonna send your concentration up pretty quickly, and that's what we saw. Um, as soon as the, the, the teams uh, went in to, to stop flow, we saw that leak just as quickly as it went up, we saw it uh, come right back down. And, uh, and so that was what we saw uh, yesterday as uh, during the, the test operations. And in terms of the path forward, and I'm going to pull Greg in here too because he's our, our, uh, our chief engineer for the ground systems. Um, in terms of the path forward and what we can do, there's a number of things that, that we believe that um, once we get access, we can go take a look at. As I described, there's a, a number of discrete uh, penetrations into this area. And so the first thing is you want to go check those. And do you have anything that's loose or obvious? Um, there's also some ambient leak checks that we can go do on the system. Uh, and, uh, and then there's some, some other um, you know, leak checks that we can do. Um, this area is typically purged with helium. You know, we could change the purge in there and, and run some helium through some of these other areas and, and use some of our has gas uh, detection equipment to go uh, see where we're seeing leaks from. So we have a couple of tools that we can go uh, that'll help us evaluate um, this particular area and these particular penetrations and figure out which one's really causing us the, the issue. Greg, anything to add on that? Uh, you, you covered it mostly, Charlie, yes. Yeah. So on the back side of that uh, ground plate, we'll call call it, uh, there is a purge can. It's a two-piece can, metal can that we bolt together. 
Uh, within that can, we have uh, several penetrations into the fill line and the bleed line. We don't think the bleed line is an issue because we weren't flowing through it. There was no pressure on it. And the, uh, the signature of the leak happened when we transitioned to fast fill. We, we rapidly increased pressure in that line. Um, the penetrations into the line, there's, uh, there's uh, three of those on the fill line. And then we have a flange connection, which has uh, two gaskets uh, with a debris plate between them. Uh, that's a bolted flange on the 8-inch line. Uh, that's another potential leak point as well. So uh, like Charlie said, we do have access to that area at the pad with the access stands. Uh, once we take that purge can off, we'll have, uh, we'll have ability to do a leak check. Now, ambient leak check is not the same as a cryogenic leak check at minus 423. So, you know, a lot of times when we do leak checks, we don't see a leak at ambient, and then you get the cryogenic temperatures, and it does leak. So we're hoping to see something obvious with one of those penetrations into the line, um, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there as we get the data. Up next, we'll have Eric Berger with Ars Technica. Hi, thank you very much for doing this. Um, I've got a couple questions. First for Mike, <clears throat> I think, is there a scenario in which you would actually launch the mission without completing a core stage wet dress test? I mean, you talked a lot about sort of the potential wear and tear on the vehicle and, and systems being out at the pad. And I'm just wondering if you'd get to a point where you would, com you know, where you would go without doing a wet dress test through terminal count. And then for Charlie, I think, can you tell me how long it's, it's going to take to launch how long you have to launch or roll back to VAB once the flight termination system is armed? I think I've heard something like three weeks, but I'd love a clarification. Thank you. Yeah, Eric. Um, so on the on the core stage, you know, one of the, the I would say the primary objective of the uh, of the wet dress rehearsal is to demonstrate the ability of the ground systems to perform these cryogenic operations with the core stage, and um, you know. <clears throat> excuse me, our ability to, to demonstrate um, both of these commodities under, under um, you know, flight-like conditions or ground, ground test conditions is, you know, what we're really after here. And um, we, we have a very large vehicle and we're flowing a lot of commodity and um, we've got some really complex physics going on. I, I would argue they're PhD level physics. Um, in, in order to uh, to complete the operation, um, we have to characterize those appropriately, and um, it, it's it, it's something that you know we, we need to go off and get enough data to show that that we can complete these these operations under the under the conditions that we will need on on day of launch. Um, that said, I mean it's it's possible that. We will get enough data um, it, it, at some point that we'll be able to demonstrate or have enough confidence in this, um, and and we'll just have to see, you know, what what residual risk there is there. Um, I I wouldn't say that that's something that we're is really in the forefront of our mind right now, but it's something that um, you know that we we could consider moving forward. I I just don't. I just don't see that right now as is our as our primary objective. Our primary objective is really getting past this leak and, and getting getting into a getting into a wet dress. And Charlie, I don't know if you want to handle the the uh, time to launch question. Yes. Yeah, so so we do have. I believe what you're referring to is um, we do have a requirement for the range for the flight safety system, and we do have a timeline associated with that, and that's 20 days. Next, we'll have Andrea Leinfelder with Houston Chronicle. Hi. Um, I would like to put this wet dress rehearsal into a bit of perspective. I'm not sure if this is a question for either of you, but um, I'm curious how it compares with the wet dress rehearsal for the Space Shuttle and the Saturn V rocket. Like, if you can describe how long those tests took and what type of issues were discovered, just so we can put this a little bit in perspective for readers. Thank you. So let's see, um, I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at this one, Mike and Greg, if you guys have any additional info, feel free to jump in here. Um, so I have the, the honor of working with um, one of the engineers. He's actually on our cryopropulsion team that was around for STS-1. 
and uh, and so we were just talking about this this week. Uh, how many tankings did it take before we got ready for launch? And I think the number was somewhere in the in the five to six prior to launch for STS one. And so um, if you if you look at that in the context of kind of where we are, um, again, shuttle was a single stage vehicle. We're trying to load two stages, so you gotta gotta get the the core stage and upper stage. Um, there are some complexities with that load uh, compared to shuttle. And so I would say putting it in context, I would say we're we're within family of our experience in the past for first time ops is how I would characterize it. But but Greg or Mike, if you want to offer. Yeah, Andrea, I, I would say um, we occasionally get to talk with uh, some graybeards that um, are around from shuttle or, or the Apollo um, Saturn time frame, and, and um, they will tell us that, you know, these systems are incredibly hard to characterize. You've got complex physics going on. You've got fluid dynamics. You've got thermodynamics. You've got flammability hazards, you've got cryogenic temperatures and structural stresses you're putting on it, not only from the weight of the, um, of the propellant, but also the structural stresses come in because you're, you're literally causing these very large cylinders to change shape because you're, you're chilling them down to, you know, minus uh, 280-ish degrees on one side and minus 450 on the other. Um, so, you know, when you take into account all these stresses and strains and fluid flow rates and, and you want to avoid having things like um, a, a geyser, uh, which is a two-phase two flow moment and, and thermo, you know, the thermodynamics that, that you're trying to stay within or avoid and all the hazard controls and all of the um, other constraints and considerations in play, I, I would say we're in family. Um, We've got much more advanced um, engineering models and techniques, and the ability to to build um, you know precise pressure vessels uh, using um, state of the art welding techniques and, and that kind of stuff. So that the flight hardware is done quite well. It's really adjusting the two together that's been a problem for us. And and I would say that you know again history has shown it's been a challenge for for pretty much anybody that's that's done anything of this magnitude. Next, we'll have Jeff South with Space News. Uh, good afternoon. A question for uh, Mike Therafin. Uh You mentioned in your opening remarks you were looking at a couple of options, one of which was to try the, the wet dress again as soon as the 21st. Uh, apologies if I, if I missed it earlier, but what other specific options are you looking at right now um, in addition to trying the wet dress later next week? Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, the options are, again, it's it's really what are the low-hanging fruit options, things that are uh, relatively straightforward, easy, obvious, um, that, that need to just be adjusted um, on this uh, on this purge canister, the penetrations that um, maybe there's an obvious leak source and, and to, to basically rectify that. Um, the uh, there are some more uh, invasive options that um, require getting further into the hardware and um, potentially having to, to to get into some extended troubleshooting um, and then uh, where is the most um, appropriate location to to conduct that um, there's yeah I mean I, I, I would say that's that's kind of the spectrum of what we're looking at um, but there are other constraints and considerations that we're looking at that have to do with um, the pad environment or if, or if we were to, to choose to not do this work out at the pad, um, what, we, what we would be giving up or gaining in that case. So there's, there's again, a number, of, a number of considerations there. I don't want to get in front of those decisions. We're, we're not ready to make that decision. We're not, we haven't fully um, um, outlined all the options right now. The, the, the one that we're pursuing, um, I would say, uh, with with great vigor, is the low-hanging fruit option, and 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 we'll we'll um, let the team kind of come up with some other other um, other options here. Again, it's been less than 24 hours since we ran into this problem. Next, we'll have Ramin Skiba with Wired Magazine. Hi, thank you. Um, this is, uh, I guess, a question for both of you. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on, on an earlier question. 
Um, uh, would you say that, I mean, considering the the complex uh, physics involved and how you know these are uh, in, in many ways new pieces of hardware, um, and uh, there's a lot at stake with this rocket, are are, are you still very confident about continuing or uh, um, you know uh, finishing the, the the wet dress rehearsal test on the launch pad and uh, hopefully launching in the next few months? Like how how or how confident do you feel about the process at this point? Yeah, Ramin, I, again, I would say the Mega Moon rocket is fine. Um, the, the vehicle has performed really well. Um, we really, the only thing we're seeing on the flight side is the uh, is this check valve on the upper stage. Um, that is a relatively straightforward thing to go to go off and resolve. The other things that we've learned have been largely um, procedural or or a, the slight adjustments in the in the um, in the operation, or the limit sets, or the, some of the some of the um, software triggers, um, those are things that are relatively straightforward to go off and do. You just need a little bit of time to work through them and confirm that that you're staying within the within the system constraints. Um, and then this this um, hydrogen leak, um, and that's on the ground side. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm confident we're going to get there. Um, if you want an exact date, I I, I can't give that to you right now. Um, it's it's really just we we will be ready when we get through the uh, the test program and um, and and we are I can promise you we are working hard to get through it um, we are putting in some long hours to do it and um, we will we will let you know when we know uh, when we're going to set up for a launch attempt I don't know, Charlie if you have any thoughts on that yeah I certainly have some thoughts on it I mean there is no doubt in my mind. Um, that we will finish this test campaign and uh, that we will listen to the hardware and the data will lead us to the next steps and we will take the appropriate steps and, uh, and we will launch this vehicle. Um, as Mike said, I don't know exactly what that date is, but there is, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, we'll finish the test campaign and we will be ready to go fly. Thanks so much and we'll have time for a final question and that'll be Micah Maidenberg with Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Uh, I think this is a message for Charlie. Could you remind us um, which contractor was responsible for uh, the umbilical uh, where the, the leak appeared and what sorts of communication, if any, you've had with, you know, that company about this issue? Thanks. And so let's see, it is our ground hardware on the ground side of the interface that where we saw this uh, this particular leak. In terms of the manufacturer of that, I would have to, I'll have to get back with you on that unless, Greg, you have information I, okay. yeah, we'll have to get that for you. But the hardware belongs to the ground systems. Thank you all for joining us today. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online by visiting the Media Resources tab at www.nasa.gov forward slash Artemis dash one later this afternoon. To follow along with updates for the wet dress rehearsal test, please go to the Artemis blog at blogs.nasa.gov forward slash Artemis and join us on the NASA Exploration Ground Systems Twitter account. You can also watch a live stream of the rocket on the pad at the KSC Newsroom YouTube channel. For those who are planning to tie in to the Crew 4 media teleconference, that has been moved up to 4.15 Eastern Time. Thanks again, and that will conclude our call.